Good evening, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with our 95th episode of the China History Podcast. Glad you could all make it. We finished off our three-part Zheng He series last week, and now we're winding the clock back another three centuries before the great admiral and 15th century diplomat extraordinaire. Last time we were in early 15th century China. Now we're going to explore the early 12th century, the calm before the storm that is going to turn the world upside down and cause a world record of death and destruction that still might stand to this day. If any of you haven't heard Dan Carlin's latest hardcore history program, I suggest you make sure that one is downloaded. His uh, Wrath of the Khans series is a fantastic look, as only the inimitable Dan Carlin knows how to do, uh, on the Mongols and what they did in the 12th and 13th centuries. No one brings history to life like Dan Carlin. Hardcore history, and he also has a political show called Common Sense. You might want to check that one out if you like all those uh, political yak shows. In this episode, I'm going to introduce another person who is right up there in the pantheon of Chinese leaders, heroes, and artists. In episode 81, I introduced the man who went on to become the god of war. This was Guan Yu. Guan Yu from the Three Kingdoms period, he, along with Liu Bei and Zhang Fei, made the Peach Garden Oath and became sworn brothers. Well, today's story is sort of along the lines of Guan Yu. Guan Yu died during the dying days of the Eastern Han in 219 AD. This was the period when China was transitioning to the fabled Three Kingdoms period, immortalized for eternity by Luo Guanzhong in his epic romance, The Three Kingdoms. Like Guan Yu, the subject of today's topic, Yue Fei, was also a military man. He lived 900 years after Guan Yu. Yue Fei lived during that period when the Song Dynasty was about to get chased out of northern China by the Jurchens. Once this happens in 1127, the Song Dynasty gets divided up into northern Song, to cover the period that was now officially over, and the Southern Song to cover the second half of the dynasty that went on to live another century and a half, based down in the south, below the Yangtze. Go back and listen to CHP episodes 28 and 29 if you want to refresh your memory about what went down during the Northern and Southern Song. UFA came from a humble background, nothing special, and when his father lost the farm up in Anyang in Henan to flooding when he was young, Yue Fei knew the only alternative to living a life as a tenant farmer was the military, and he ended up excelling in all manners of warfare and strategy. I didn't mention Yue Fei in the Southern Song Dynasty episode 29. As I said when we did those uh, imperial dynasty overviews from the Xia to the Qing, I said we'd keep coming back to these days and revisit some of the particulars of each era. So we're back in the Song again, one of the golden ages of China. The founder of the Song, Zhao Kuangyin, he and his progeny had to coexist for the entirety of their dynasty with none too friendly neighbors to the north and west. When you talk about the northern Song, you have to also mention the other three elephants in the room. The dynasties of the Western Xia, or Xi Xia, the Liao dynasty of the Qidan people, or Kitan as I called them, uh, Dan Carlin calls them Chitan, and the big daddy of them all, the roughest and toughest kid on the block, were the Jurchens. These were the predecessors of the Manchus who ruled China during the Qing dynasty. The Song rulers were paying them all off to keep the peace and serenity and you know, keep these guys at a distance. There was no other way. These northern nomadic tribesmen had been a perennial pain in the backside to China proper, going back to time immemorial. During the Song, they were still there. Well, you might recall from the previous episodes covering the period uh, of the western Xia and the Liao, they were both conquered by the Jurchens, who founded the Jin dynasty. Then the Jurchens made life unbearable for the Song rulers. Those people to the north and the northwest, they were an ever-present threat. Even though they had to be paid off with all the nice things China could offer them, they still made incursions into their territory. The overriding political issue in Song Dynasty China, northern and southern, was the issue of appeasement versus fighting back. This is the main theme in today's topic. In our subject today, Yue Fei, he came to stand 
for resistance against the Jurchen invaders and recovering lost parts of Song, China. Considered second only to Guan Yu himself in the list of Chinese military heroes of days gone by, Yue Fei, with his resistance to the Jurchens and his obsession to recover the lands of northern China, he's considered a model for Chinese patriots who were inspired by him all the way up to present times. So great is Yue Fei held in the esteem of the people that in the 1960s, during the heat of the Cultural Revolution, his tomb in Hangzhou, the Yue Fei Miao, was trashed, and Yue Fei's remains were desecrated by the Red Guards. Graffiti later on appeared that asked simply, who did this? Yue is a sacred cow in the pantheon of inspirational Chinese gods, heroes, and legends. And today, we'll look at who he was, what he did, and why so many Chinese around the world revere him. So, Yue 1103 to 1142, 39 years only on this earth. This is the time of Sigurd the Crusader, Sigurd Magnuson, uh, the Knights Templar, the Kingdom of Jerusalem... We are after the First Crusade and before the Second, just as it was during the time of Zheng He in the Ming. This period in the Song Dynasty sees China as still the greatest and most advanced civilization at the time. The Song capital at Kaifeng was the largest city in the world. There was no place else like it, just as there was no place like Chang'an back in its day. But all these good times came to a crashing and tragic end, as we said before in CHP episode 28. The Jing Kong Incident, a.k.a. the humiliation at Jing Kong. Yes, so horrific and gut-wrenching is this event in Chinese history. In Chinese, it's merely called the Jing Kong Incident, the Jing Kong Shi Bian. Best to forget about this whole event and not call too much attention to it. Despite all these attempts to appease the Jurchens, they came like lightning and smashed Kaifeng to smithereens and besides carrying off all the wealth and treasures of the Song and sacking the city. They nabbed the emperor, his father, the retired emperor, and the whole dang imperial court, lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. And with that, the Jurchens and their imperial captives all headed north on their baton death march to the harsh and unforgiving part of China that the Jurchens call home. This is present-day Liaoning, Qilin, and Heilongjiang. The whole Song Upper Crust lived out their days in Dongbei, the northeast, Manchuria, never again to wallow in the pleasures and delights that sophisticated and lovely Kaifeng had to offer. The Jurchens had not quite done to Kaifeng what Scipio Africanus the Younger did to Carthage, but let's just say the place wasn't very livable after they got through with it. And the fates of these former royals living as captives of the cruel Jurchens was tortuous and unpleasant as can be. That was in March of 1127. But there was one royal who got away, and the hopes of the Song dynasty living on were contained in his person. The Gaozong emperor, Zhao Go, he got away, and as the story goes, as he was on his way to surrender himself to the Jurchens, he passed through the military camp where Yue was present, and he was beseeched by the commander to not your faith, someone else, to become the tip of the spear to lead the Chinese in their resistance against the Jurchens, who had now founded a new dynasty, the Jin. So Zhao Go, all hopes are pinned on him. He becomes the emperor, and everything begins to coalesce around him. After a period of being on the run from the Jurchens, who are hot on his trail, they finally set up their capital in Lin'an, which is where present-day Hangzhou is. They couldn't have picked a more idyllic spot. Yue he was a professional soldier. There was no centralized standing army yet. The military defense of the southern Song was subcontracted out to strongmen out in the provinces who were financed by the state. Their two main jobs were to keep the barbarians at bay, and of course, if called upon, they had to deal with local disturbances in their particular territory, including the perennial plague of banditry, Yue worked for one of these military commanders. He had little formal education, but he was literate thanks to his father who taught him when he was young. Later on, when the fires are burning hottest as far as the myth of Yue goes, he'll be made into the sage warrior and 
general literatus and a lot of stories and legends are going to be attributed to UFA's, you know, literary genius to, you know, build his brand. 1115, the Jin dynasty is formed after they do away with the Liao. 1123, UFA's father passes away and he sits out the battles for the obligatory three-year mourning period. In 1126, he signs up for another stint with a local commander. 1127, the Jing Kang Shipian, Curtains for the Northern Song, now starts the Southern Song with the inexperienced and notoriously indecisive 20 year old Gaozong Emperor on the throne. The Jurchens are only 6 million strong in northern China, lording it over a sea of 45 million Chinese. This wasn't going to be easy no matter how tough these guys were. If you threw in the Qidan from the conquered Liao, that added another 4 million, perhaps. So while the Jin forces were very effective at punching the Song out, now they had to hold on to what they had. The Jin forces chased Prince Kang, the Gaozong Emperor's title at the conclusion of the Northern Song. Uh, he, they chased him all over China, through Hebei, Shandong, Henan. They knew darn well what he intended to do, so the name of the game was to nip that one in the bud. Once they could stamp Prince Kang, Zhao Go, out, that would put a major wrench in the works as far as how to reconstitute the Song Dynasty in safer lands. Of course, Zhao Go manages to get away and began to form a government after declaring himself emperor on June 12, 1127. He sets up the first capital in Shangqiu in Henan, 85 miles south of Kaifeng. Now, this guy had the same albatross around his neck as the Yongle emperor. You remember him from the last episodes. There were questions about his legitimacy and if he really, truly, actually, for sure, was supposed to be the next in line. Even considering what happened with the uh, Jing Kang Shi Bian, throughout his reign, the Gaozong Emperor always had to stress out that the Jurchens might let one of his brothers go and then it would throw his legitimacy into question. It never happened, but he sure was worried about it. The Jurchens turned up the heat and chased the Song resistance out of Shangqiu, and they regrouped in Yangzhou, where they stayed till 1129. Then they got chased out of Yangzhou and barely escaped across the Yangtze to the vinegar capital of China, Zhenjiang. From there, he escapes to Lin'an, which is the general location of present-day Hangzhou, and that's where he sets up his base, and that's where the southern Song capital is built. But he's got problems. He's not the greatest leader, and he was still a kid for all intents and purposes. While he's trying to keep the Jurchens at a distance, he's also fighting for his political life in the capital at Lin'an. Finally, January 26th, 1130, the Jurchens storm Lin'an, and the emperor is forced to make a dramatic escape and becomes the first head of state to take to the sea aboard a ship. He does this in no less a place than Zhou Shan, located just east of my second home in Ningbo. He stays away, sailing off the China coast till things simmer down, and then he heads back towards Lin'an, staying for a few years in uh, Shaoxing, the city of so many famous historic people I mentioned a couple episodes ago. Once it's safe, he makes his way back to Lin'an, or Hangzhou. He's racked with guilt for being the only one who got away and feels he abandoned his father and brothers who were now in captivity. Scholars have generally agreed the Gaozong Emperor never knew where to line up when it came to sino jurchen relations. On the one hand, he had to be careful to keep them at bay at all costs, even if this meant giving in often to their demands. But on the other hand, he also could not appear too weak and let those guys know the Southern Song Empire was, you know, going to be an easy pushover. And that's where UFA largely comes in. Not until he meets an early death in 1142, which we'll get to sooner or later, does he ever let up against his relentless campaigns against the Jin armies. He'd make one daring incursion after another across the Yangtze and deep into former Song territories, recovering lost lands. There were other military commanders during the southern Song who fought valiantly against the Jin invaders and inflicted their own damage. Han Shizong was most prominent among them. But it was UFA who most of all embodied that fierceness to resist a powerful aggressor who dared to invade Chinese lands that has resonated throughout the centuries. The story of the Gaozong Emperor waffling between appeasement and doing battle was 
lived out in real life between the struggles of Yue Fei and the emperor's chief counselor, Qin Hui. General Yue Fei and his Yue Fei family army, as it was known, the uh, Yue Jia Qun, they always stood on the side of resisting the Jin. Everyone knew this. Now, Qin Hui, on the other hand, he was the head of the peace faction, or peace party, whatever you want to call them, who believed the best and safest route to self-preservation in these times was to placate the Jurchen rulers and just give them what they wanted. Qin Hui, he came into the employ of the Gaozong emperor under suspicious circumstances. He was there at Jingkang and was among the captives taken to Manchuria to Jurchen territory along with the rest of the imperial court. And then later on, they let this guy loose and he heads south to hook up with the emperor and convinces him to take him on as his chief counselor. After all, he had spent all this time with the Jurchens and they had taken him into their confidence and who better than Xin Hui to guide the young emperor through these treacherous waters dealing with the Jin? He's sort of this Manchurian candidate, but only for real. There's no proof that I was able to find that said he had sold the southern Song government down the river to the Jurchens or the Jin, but it sure looks suspicious. At every moment of crisis, Qin Hui would whisper in the emperor's ear, let it be, they're not so bad, we can give in on these small things, you know, and so on and so forth. And it was like this throughout the 1130s and 1140s. Qin Hui, on one side, obviously, with an air shot of the emperor whenever he needed to be, telling the emperor, don't be the one to break the peace. And then you'd have Yue Fei carrying out all kinds of acts of violence against the Jurchens in a series of daring battles. He went as far north as the ancient Zhou capital of Luoyang, that is, deep into enemy territory. But this was the thing. It wasn't enemy territory. That was the heart and soul of China, going back to the beginning. Those ancient lands between the Huai and the Yellow Rivers, they had been conquered by foreign invaders. And so you can see what I'm getting at. A time like this, a fierce resistance fighter, a nemesis in the form of a chief minister who's an apologist for the enemy, treachery. You can see why this story has all the makings of a great legend. After dealing with the invading Jin on a number of occasions and proving himself in battle, Yue Fei is given the command of the central Yangtze region, and part of his job included keeping the Jurchens on the north side of the Yangtze and to protect the south bank. He's only 30 years old when given this command. In 1134, Yue Fei led one of his patented daring raids on the Jin puppet state of Qi, and there was, after the fall of the northern Song, a sort of buffer area or demilitarized zone that was between the Huai and the Yangtze rivers. But there were at least four of these campaigns recorded into the books over the period of the 1130s where Yue Fei led his troops deep into Jin territory to inflict whatever damage they could. And this, too, is part of the legend, that only Yue Fei had the guts to go as far north as he did to fight the Jurchens. This is the legend only. Others went, too. I mentioned uh, Han Shizong already. In 1134, after another success fighting the Jin in the north and teaching them not to push the southern Song around, Yue Fei is given command of the China Central Field, based in Ezhou, near Wuhan. And this remains Yue Fei's base, for the rest of his days in Ezhou. Because this happened in his bailiwick, Yue Fei was called in to deal with a certain rebellion that had started out small but got big very fast. This first concerned a rebel named Zhong Xiang. He had started his rebellion in 1132, and by now it had spiraled out of control. And he dared to call for all this crazy egalitarianism stuff mixed with a little religion, no doubt Taoism. Some of what he said went like this. The law separates the high and the low, the rich man and the poor man. I shall publish a law ordering the high and the low, the rich and the poor, to be equal. This kind of talk scared conservatives and elites back then as much as it does today. The last thing elites want to hear is talk like this. Zhong Xiang went as far as to declare himself the king of Chu. Well, the Song forces went after him and were able to prevail, capturing Zhong Xiang and executing him. But that snake grew another head at once, and this came in the form of one Yang Yao. 
He takes over where Zhong Xiang left off and went on the rampage all over the place. And with his egalitarian politics and religion, he was creating social havoc all over central China. And this is when they called in Yue Fei, and he had to come in and deal with Yang Yao. Yang Yao was one of the first to take advantage of these new innovations in shipbuilding. This was paddle wheel technology. Yang Yao was cruising these big ships up and down the Yangtze, causing trouble wherever he went. Yue Fei simply seized these vessels from Yang Yao in battle and then used them against him. And by 1135, Yang Yao has been defeated and executed. And with this act of seizing Yang Yao's ships, you have the informal beginnings of China's first standing navy. One other worrying thing at least to Qin Hui, who was not happy at all to see Yue Fei doing so well. Yue Fei absorbed 50,000 troops from Yang Yao, and now his ranks of soldiers had swollen to over 100,000. This made Yue Fei one of the top four military guys in the southern Song. In his Yue family army, or Yue Jia Jun, another myth tells about how disciplined and loyal Yue Fei's army was. They were excellently trained and never messed with the people. They followed a very strict and honorable code of conduct. In fact, time and again, they were used to not only deal with the Jurchens, but with local bandits as well. But Yue had long acquired the reputation for his obsession to recover all the lost lands of North China. The legend of Yue was, in his lifetime, already beginning to take off. But how to deal with Qin Hui? As Yue Fei's legend of heroism and patriotism grew over the decades and centuries, so did Qin Hui's legend of infamy and treachery. Qin Hui is considered a traitor to China for his role in facilitating one of the great acts of perfidy against a loyal military commander. In 1140, after Yue Fei's fourth campaign up in the north, he is abruptly ordered to retreat and is summoned to the imperial court in Lin'an, but it wasn't just Yue Fei. The order went out to all these military commanders. Qin Hui and his peace faction had successfully lobbied the emperor to call these guys back and replace them in the field with civilian commanders. In the late summer of that year, Yue Fei shows up in Hangzhou and he's spitting nickels over this whole matter. In defiance, he protests this act of appeasement with the Jurchens. Nonetheless, he's told to stand down, and he was reassigned to a different post. A few months later, he was called back again to the imperial court, and this time he was relieved of military command and given some desk job. But just as he said would happen, attempts by the Gaozong Emperor and Qin Hui's peace faction to make nice with the Jin all came to naught. Soon the heat was turned up in the southern Song capital, and they called Yue Fei back to push these guys back and deal with the situation at hand. While he was away on this assignment, Qin Hui was finally able to convince the emperor to go with making a lasting peace with the Jurchens. What Qin Hui had in mind was the Treaty of Shaoxing. Yes, that great and historic city again. In this treaty, the Song Emperor was planning to give everything away, and in return, once and for all, the Jin would go back north and leave them alone. Finally. Yue Fei wouldn't go for this, and he continued to call for fighting. As the legend goes, the emperor sent a gold medal to the front lines. This gold medal, or Jinpai, represented the word of the emperor, and his word was, come back to the palace. But Yue Fei ignored this, knowing it was more important to defend the borders at such a critical time. The emperor sends another gold medal, again, ignored. He sends another and another until 12 gold medals were received by Yue Fei, and the enormity of the emperor's order just set in. So Yue Fei, he couldn't refuse. This was all Qin Hui's idea to call him back once and for all. He knew he could persuade the emperor to go along with his plan. This time when he came back, Qin Hui, with the emperor's blessing, had Yue Fei thrown in prison on trumped-up charges of insubordination and malfeasance. In prison, as the story goes, he was tortured and confessed to nothing, and ultimately, on Qin Hui's orders with the Gaozong Emperor's backing, Yue Fei was killed, either by poison or some other means. Before he died, though, the other great military commander of the day, Han Shizong, paid a visit to Yue Fei's prison cell and inquired what Yue Fei had done to have wound up this way. 
Thereupon, Yufei utters the immortal words, Mo Shuyo, a vague, nonsensical meaning that has come to mean utterly groundless, trumped-up charges. But before he died, when he valiantly faced his accusers in court who were charging him with selling out the country, perhaps one of the most legendary stories goes down. And Yufei removes his upper garment to reveal four large characters tattooed on his back. And they read, Jin Zhong Bao Guo, or serve the country with the utmost loyalty. Now, how can a man who has this tattooed across his back be a traitor? The story goes on about how he, you know, got this tattoo from his mother when he was young, but, you know, it's all part of the legend. Now, with UFA out of the way, this Shaoxing He Yi, the Treaty of Shaoxing, could happen without any obstruction. As for UFA's role in the treaty, the story goes that so much did the Jurchens despise UFA, part of the deal was that he needed to be disposed of. And so, Qin Hui was only too happy to do this, and the Gaozong Emperor is guilty for allowing this to happen. Before Yuefei's body could be disposed of, his followers stole it and buried him temporarily in a secret location until the day that the verdict would be reversed and Yuefei rehabilitated. To prevent that, Qin Hui whitewashed the entire affair for the next ten years or more, burning records and making the whole affair look like Yuefei was guilty. The southern Song had their peace, but like Chamberlain was to learn 777 years later, there was not going to be any peace for our time. There was a new power in the Jurchen northern lands. This was the Sinophile Jin Emperor Hai Wang. By 1161, he was outside the gates of Nanjing, poised to attack. But it ends badly for this Kublai Khan wannabe. He had designs on the southern Song, and sure enough, he invaded and lost. The demise of this Hailing Wang was remembered for two significant battles. These were at Caixi along the Yangtze and later at Tangdao on the East China Sea. These were China's first naval battles. This was in 1161, 19 years after the passing of Yuefei. This invasion by the Jin in 1161 really shook up the Gaozong Emperor. He wasn't quite kicking himself in the ass, but he knew if UFA was around, he'd say, I told you so. So just like when Chairman Mao had to go to Chen Yi's funeral in 1972, so the Gaozong emperor had to make amends with his military that he had forsaken while he was being manipulated by Qin Hui and the peace faction. He posthumously pardoned UFA along with his son and one other chief associate who went down with him in 1142. The emperor also gave pardons to several northern Song political and military figures who had been persecuted in the 1130s and 40s when the push and pull between those who wanted peace and those who wanted war was going on. They all got posthumous pardons, and just as God gave to Job, the emperor restored these men's fortunes and titles. And that act allowed the southern Song military to know the emperor was on their side. And for this... They did their job and kept an eye on the Huai Yangtze buffer zone and made sure nothing spilled over to their side of the river. The Jurchens had already trampled on the Treaty of Shaoxing, and everyone knew they couldn't be trusted and had to be watched. The Gaozong Emperor abdicated a year later in 1162 and was succeeded by his stepson, who became the Xiaozong Emperor. Gaozong, however, had some staying power. He didn't pass away till 1187. The Xiaozong Emperor, too, continued on with the deconstruction of all of Qin Hui's policies and vilifying him through various edicts. He also went all the way in rehabilitating Yuefei and even made him posthumously the king of Ur. Remember, this was his sort of fief just outside of Wuhan, Zhou. Today, there are all kinds of statues, temples, and whatnot honoring Yuefei and his close association to that area around Wuhan, or the old kingdom of Ur. By now, the legend of Yuefei really started to gather momentum. With all the emperor had just done to honor Yuefei and the 126 battles he fought in, the myths of the loyal and upright soldier wronged by his king began to grow like moss. The stories not only of Yuefei's achievements as a military leader and strategist, but also of his skills as a poet and an author of Chinese 
That's ci c i in、uh, pinyin, second tone. This was a kind of lyric poetry specific to Chinese. This is purely a Chinese thing, and it's beautiful to hear, even though I can't understand a word of it. It's all classical Chinese, which is a whole different galaxy from vernacular Mandarin. Ouyang Xiao, who we featured in CHP episode seventy-one, was considered a great writer of this kind of Chinese ci poetry. Yue Fei's skills as a kung fu master are also extolled, as well as the two styles that are attributed to him: the eagle claw and Xing Yi style. It was with Yue Fei's grandson that the legend of Yue Fei really began to take off. This grandson, named Yue Ke, he wrote the Er Guo Jin Tuo Zui Bian. This is the official biography of Yue Fei, and it was folded into the history of the Song, the Song Shi, one of the twenty-four official histories of China. The Shi Ji by Sima Qian being the first of the twenty-four. Today, the spirit of Yue Fei lives on in hundreds of Chinese wuxia novels, movies, TV serial dramas, Peking opera, video games, advertisements—you name it. During the late 1930s and into the 40s, when Japan was running amok in China, occupying large swaths of territory along the coast, the spirit of Yue Fei was invoked and was remembered during those trying times. And most of all, his immortal words, "Huan Wo He Shan," return my rivers and mountains. This is what Yue Fei demanded and fought for, and what made him a legend. As I mentioned at the outset, he has this nice temple and tomb located in Hangzhou. Before we close out for the day, I wanted to mention the tomb. In 1163, the Xiaozong Emperor, in giving Yue Fei posthumous recognition, allowed this tomb and temple to be built on the northwest bank of West Lake in Hangzhou at、uh, Qixia Hill. There are two sets of two statues made from iron that are placed in front of the tomb. Two of the people are Qin Hui and his wife, who I didn't mention, but was a conniving, no good troublemaker who liked Yue Fei as much as her husband did. Those two were primarily responsible for bringing down Yue Fei. They are shown kneeling in front of the statue of Yue Fei. There are another two statues. These are for two accomplices, Zhang Jun and Mo Qixie, who also helped with the murder of Yue Fei. So these four statues kneel. In perpetuity and reverence to the man, they all helped to bring down, and in so doing, turned him into a bigger and greater legend than ever. I don't know about now, but it used to be common for passers-by and visitors to the temple who, you know, came to pay their respects to Yue Fei to spit on these statues and to revile them.、Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, another legend has it that one of the street vendors selling buns in the streets of Hangzhou during the time of、uh, Southern Song or whenever created this deep-fried pastry called the Yuja Gui. This came from Yuja Qin Hui. A deep fry Qin Hui. It was two long pieces of dough, one piece representing Qin Hui and the other piece of dough representing his evil wife, and they're twisted together and then thrown in a vat of hot oil. And that, my friends, is where the yotiao came from. So think of Qin Hui and his wife next time you have your doujiang and yotiao. Since history is always written by the victors, the whole power struggle of Yue Fei and Qin Hui is still up in the air to a certain extent. So much legend and myth surrounds Yue Fei's greatness and Qin Hui's evilness. It probably obscures what the truth is. He lasted a long time at the highest levels of power. Qin Hui did, and despite the persecution of Yue Fei when he passed from the scene in 1155, the Southern Song was on rather firm footing with a very efficient government in place. So let's close out Yue Fei with the immortal words from his most famous "ci"、uh, in English translation, of course. My wrath bristles through my helmet. The rain stops as I stand by the rain. I look up towards the sky and let loose a passionate roar. Let us ride our chariots through the Hulan Pass. There we shall feast on barbarian flesh and drink the blood of the Xiongnu. Let us begin anew to recover our old empire. Before paying tribute to the emperor, you know the big bad Jin and the Southern Song. They fought each other, and the Chinese had to go to great lengths to defend themselves against these Jin armies. 
but by 1234, the jinn were already spoken of in the past tense. As big and bad and vicious as the jurchens were, when the Mongols came roaring through, they just flattened the jinn. And then for a while, until 1279, the southern Song hung in there, but they too went down for the count. And once all of China fell under the Mongol yoke, people recalled their hero, UFA, and wished they had him now to deal with yet another foreign occupier of the China heartland. And that's going to be the short and long of it. UFA, ladies and gentlemen, and from a raging hot Claremont, California, here on the very edge of L.A. County, this is Laszlo Montgomery once again signing off and wishing you all the very best. I hope you'll join us next week when we look at someone from the Jin Dynasty, this one the Jin, fourth tone of the 4th century A.D. The Jurchen Jin Dynasty is Jin, first tone. So we're going to look at uh, someone from the Jin next time. So thanks, everyone, for downloading and listening. I hope you'll join us next week for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.